Thank you for checking out Murder Dictionary Podcast. I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we are still learning the ropes of audio and podcasting in general. The sound quality and content will get better as we get more experience, so please bear with us through this learning curve. We focus mostly on the murderers, so some listeners may feel that the subject is approached too lightheartedly and with a lack of focus on the victims. Although we want to be sensitive to that, we cannot help but focus on the details or facts that we find most fascinating. And for us, that is often the life of the murderer and the details of the crimes. We appreciate you checking us out and hope that you are also interested in the stories that we are intrigued enough by to explore. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. The moon, yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send her my condolences. hi oh. This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. Welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and with me is Kelly. Hey. Before we start, I just wanted to let you guys know that we are officially on social media. We have a Facebook, an Instagram, a Twitter, and we are also on Patreon if you want to support us there. If you are unable to do so, you can also just let your friends and family and any true crime junkies like us know that we are out here. I encourage you to rate, review, subscribe on iTunes as well. And on to our subject for today, which is copycats. We looked into copycat criminals and killers and found a little bit of information to start off with. Most individuals who mimic crimes seen in the media, especially news and violent movies, have in most cases prior criminal records, prior severe mental health problems, or histories of violence. This means that the effect of the media is indirect, more affecting the crime or details or method, rather than directly affecting the number of criminals or causing criminal acts. The reaction to crimes in the media can determine the actions of another criminal. This is because most copycat criminals are motivated by the shock value of their actions. They want to do something that will garner more media coverage because the attention that they will get, as well as instilling the fear into the general public. Sounds like a like a bad, vicious cycle. Like, the more coverage they get, the more they're like, fuck yeah. And the more people learn that they could get attention by committing these crimes, and then more copycats. Yeah, copycat killing is kind of like, you know, like if you had a YouTube channel, and then you just talked about like a bunch of like celebrity people, like you already just... <laughs> You already just get fame by bringing up <laughs> Just those because people. their names are in there. Yeah, and you're just, you know, just talk shit about, like, some main figure and someone's going to be like... It's just you? cheating your way into into stardom. Yeah, not you're doing something someone already did. It's lazy. Go, yeah. <laughs> it's very lazy. Be creative with your murders, please. <laughs> Figures in the public consciousness also influence the style and method of a copycat. Present day copycats dress as their favorite villain or reenact a crime from their favorite movie, whereas in the Middle Ages, crimes would be associated with devil, snakes, or witches. But in both scenarios, it is the public interest and reaction that is most influential for a criminal's choices. Some researchers hold the view that an individual's reaction to violent media content and emotional development play a role in copycat behaviors. Individuals who are less emotionally developed, mental or personality disorders, failure in human bonding or lack of identity, social isolation, and alienation will be more likely to mimic the crimes they see on TV. 
It is also theorized that the offenders most likely to be influenced by these characteristics are usually under the age of 25. Although the theory is worth mentioning, it is also the subject of ongoing debates. It seems really young. Yeah, they're just easily influenced. And yeah, that's just the age where a lot of uh, outside input can influence their actions, I guess. Yeah. So I found an awesome quote from Lauren Coleman, author of Suicide Clusters and the Copycat Effect. She said, the media must drop their cliched stories about the nice boy next door or the lone nut. The copycat violent individual is neither mysterious nor healthy, nor usually an overachiever. They are often a fatal combination of despondency, depression, and mental illness. Sounds like a pretty sweet cocktail to me. Yeah. So we're going to kick it off with Kelly and the <clears throat> Hill Hillside Stranglers murders. Okay, so um, the original crime, uh, two cousins, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono, killed nine women in the Los Angeles area in late 1977 and early 1978. Bianchi ultimately pled guilty to five of the murders and testified against Bono. Both were sentenced to life in prison. Veronica Lynn Compton was a 24-year-old actress and playwright who developed a drug habit and a fascination for serial killers. She wrote a screenplay titled The Mutilated Cutter, which was about a female serial killer. In 1980, she sent Hillside Strangler Kenneth Bianchi a copy of the script, hoping to gain his opinion about it. Hey, what do you think of all this murder I'm writing about? I love it. It's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, the two began to correspond and eventually discuss the murderous fantasies they had in common. This Com sounds like us. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. That's hot. I'm almost there. I'm going to bust. That's how we started a podcast, <laughs> <Yeah>. though. <laughs> <laughs> Smart, yeah. Let's... I just think this is adorable. Yeah. Instead of just sending cute little texts to each other. Like, <laughs> let's do this. Basically, they began to correspond and eventually discuss the murderous fantasies they had in common, which is a great icebreaker and just a good way to warm you up like the You like murder? I like murder. Yeah. Tell me about your fantasies. <laughs> Does it involve murder? And rope. <laughs> <laughs> Something sharp. Murder by rope. Yeah. Lots of screams. Compton quickly fell in love with uh, Bianchi. Who couldn't? <laughs> <laughs> He's basically irresistible. And yeah, and he took advantage of the relationship. He invited Compton to visit him in prison, hoping that he'd get her to commit crimes that would help him convince authorities that the real Hillside Strangler was still at large. He smuggled to her a plastic glove with a sample of semen in it. Just a sample. <laughs> just a tiny bit. Just like Costco. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to taste on it before I really commit I'm, to I'm the I'm going to have dinner soon, Yeah. so I don't want to ruin my dinner. <laughs> So just give me a sample. <laughs> um, he smuggled to her. Oh, yeah. So the plastic glove with a little sample of semen in it, instructing her to copy the Hillside Strangler murders and plant the semen in the victim. With a glove? Like, did she have to, like, you know like, how you do with the cake frosting things? <laughs> <laughs> like, she just put some icing on. It looked yeah. like a flower. She just squeezes it as hard as she can. Like what you do with toothpaste. <laughs> just get the last little bit out. Uh, she turned her upside down to shake <laughs> <laughs> Make sure it really got Put in some there. water in there. Yeah. Uh, so Compton obeyed and went to Bellingham, Washington with the semen in hand. Or pocket or yeah. purse or something. <laughs> yeah, that Thank sounds you. safer. Or like, is there a case, a specific case, <laughs> like a bento box made for gloves full of semen? <laughs> oh, my God. Using the alias Karen, Compton befriended a 26-year-old Kim Breed in a Bellingham, Washington tavern around 10 p.m. The two hung out for a while, during which time Compton accompanied Breed as she did some grocery shopping and she went home to feed her children. Then why are you in a bar? <laughs> yeah, exactly. At 10 p.m. Jesus. She's like, you know, I forgot. I forgot. to. I forgot them. I have fucking kids. Yeah. <laughs> Forget <laughs> about feeding them. I apparently forgot that they even existed because I'm in a bar at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, man. Let's just, Kim, get another shot going. We got to get out. We got to go. This we got to go. go feed these kids. <laughs> yeah. They got to get to school. School, give me a shot. Yeah. <laughs> so afterwards, after they fed the kids, they drank, did cocaine, and danced with some of Kim's friends. Compton then invited Breed to have a drink in her room at the Shangri-La Motel where she was staying, and Breed accepted the offer. Compton then bound and attempted to kill Breed, but after a struggle, her would-be victim escaped and alerted a friend. Call the police. Yes. A call friend. The cops. What the hell? What is your friend going to do? <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so just run. Like, come by the motel and actually get murdered, too? Yeah. Or, come if you on. ever call me and say you're getting <laughs> murdered, I'll be like... Just... That's the worst friend ever. Hey, <laughs> I'm getting murdered right now. Can yeah. you come and also get murdered? That's yeah. the worst. Just uh, just tell me your fucking coordinates so I can send some cops because you're too stupid to call the cops. Right? Like, I know oh, you need stupid. me right now? Great, I'm going to call 911. Yeah, just... Can I... Let's three-way call 911. <laughs> Let's see what they have to Please say hold. about this. Yeah. <laughs> Compton fled the scene, taking a flight to San Francisco. Upon arriving, she became hysterical and caused a scene in the airport. Compton also sent a letter and a tape to Bellingham police, claiming that Bianchi was innocent and pointing to her own strangling attempt as proof that the real Hillside Strangler was still on the loose. Police were soon able to connect the police report of the attempted copycat murder to the scene Compton brought up at the airport. When she was arrested, Compton said she was under Bianchi's evil spell, addicted to cocaine, and also was in turmoil over being physically and sexually abused during her youth. That's just no excuse. Yeah, no. That combination, other people have it and they don't murder. Just don't murder, dude. You're a murderer to begin with. (laughs) Yeah, just don't. I mean, cocaine you can get over, sexual abuse you can get over, but that evil spell, that love spell, (laughs) love makes you do crazy things. Uh, She was found guilty of first degree murder. Yeah, so none of those actually, none of her excuses work. They were like, okay, that's nice, but... But you still try to fucking kill someone. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. You're still an attempted murderer, no matter what the reason is behind it. Any more excuses? Did you... Right. Got anything else? We can write a list. We can spreadsheet this, brainstorm, get a whiteboard out. But she wasn't sentenced to life. She was only sentenced to 14 years and became eligible for parole in 1994. Uh, One psychologist said that she had a severe antisocial personality disorder, and another called her a shrewd manipulator it's just another way of saying i hate women yeah just a shrewd (laughs) like shrewd only applies to women if you dislike women and you want to talk shit about them you use the word shrewd for sure the prosecutor for her case called her dangerous and bizarre though bianchi continued to write her compton lost interest in him and fell in love with another serial killer douglas daniel clark who along with his wife and partner carolyn bundy killed and decapitated seven women in Los Angeles. So basically she has a type, and it's serial killers. The ultimate bad boy. She dropped that zero in. (laughs) (laughs) And got with a a larger zero. (laughs) Yeah, a much larger... Seven women in Los Angeles they decapitated with his yeah. wife. Like, I mean, a regular day at the beach would have been fine. Was, a nice, <laughs> Sounds like a really bad date. Yeah, Jesus. date night is fucked up in that household. <laughs> Clark sent her a Valentine's Day style letter with the photo of a headless female corpse and the two began to write each other until sometime in 1988. Candygram. Yes. So sweet. Uh, She escaped from prison for about a week and a half in 1988 by using bolt cutters on an exterior fence. Which she probably smuggled with a glove. (laughs) Yeah, there's no way she just happened to have those lying around. Just those got smuggled in. Or they were just lying around by some stupid, like, stupid guard that just left. Just wasn't paying attention. Yeah. yeah. Or just wanted to see something happen. It's like, like, this will be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Work's been boring lately. Yeah. Let me leave these bowl cutters Let's out. Spice it up. <laughs> After recapture, she was released on parole in 1996. Parole was quickly revoked after she failed to comply with its terms. Since that time, Compton seems to have turned her life around and credits positive changes in her life to her relationship with retired political science professor James Wallace, who fathered their daughter during a conjugal visit here at Washington Correction Center. In 2003, Compton was released from prison after completing her sentence and hasn't been heard from since. It seems like she pretty much disappeared. There's yeah. really no record of her. She hasn't had any arrests since then, which, I mean, I guess she did turn her life around. But still, as Kim Breed, like the victim, that just wouldn't make me feel any better. That's yeah, still Yeah, she got her awful. life, I mean, fucked with, and you have to go to all these trials and deal with this. And now, you know, your attempted murderer is out free. there. It's free. Yeah, and she, she's got a couple slaps on the hands where your parole was revoked. Yeah, it just seems like it took her a long time to turn it around. Yeah, she got way too many chances, I guess. Yeah. Right? And she got sure. out 14 years? It just doesn't seem like long mm-hmm. enough, but I don't know. So moving on to the Zodiac Killer copycat. The original Zodiac killed five and injured two in San Francisco in the late 60s and early 70s. He possibly killed closer to 20 or 30 since some crimes were similar to his previous but were not linked to him. 
Zodiac himself claimed to have killed 37. It's a very high number. Yeah, it seems like there's a big gap there. Five of, Like, to... a bunch of other ones that they can't really pin down to him. I mean, the ones that, that were five were eyewitness accounts that people actually saw him. Mm-hmm. But still, it just seems like there's got to be more that... It would be easy to say that it was him, you know? So Mm. the killer originated the name Zodiac in a series of taunting letters sent to the local Bay Area press. These letters included four cryptograms or ciphers. Of the four cryptograms sent, only one has been definitively solved. I don't know. To me, it just seems like there's two options. He was really smart and way too smart because everybody has been trying to figure these out for fucking ever. Mm. Or... He's just fucking with us. Like, the cryptograms mean nothing. Bullshit. They're complete bullshit. It's a complete lie. He just put them in there to throw us off or something. He's fucking with us And he's like, oh, I'm smarter than you, and you can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's just all bullshit. But that's just... I I have nothing to back that up. That's just my theory. I don't know shit. (laughs) (laughs) Despite an intensive search for the killer and the investigation into numerous suspects, Zodiac's identity is still unknown, and the case remains open. The mystery surrounding it has been the subject of countless books, theories, and movies that Kelly jerks off to. Yes, I, I bet you the Zo- I imagine if you just like you. I mean, how would you know that you've never ran into someone that's like never been caught of a murder? I yeah. I bet you the Zodiac killer is that fucking grumpy old man behind me in the Vons, like bumping me with his shopping cart in line. I just want to fucking He's no longer him. murdering, but he's the most annoying old man you could ever imagine. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> just tiny murders of your soul every day. <laughs> bumping me and bumping me and bumping me. You want to <laughs> say something, but he's fucking a hundred, so I got to respect my elders. and. But also you can't say anything because if you do, maybe you'll get murdered. Yeah, I feel like the really old um like the old 92 year old men that are really look frail are gonna be the ones that i'm gonna get murdered by it's not gonna be (laughs) this the 300 pound six foot tall guy that murders me i'll outrun him or something but it's gonna be the old scrawny motherfucker yeah with his bony hand just (laughs) strangling me oh and his cold dead limbs almost dead i'm sorry (laughs) that's what i would imagine so gross (laughs) so not i went to i went to the grocery store today so and i'm still trying Yeah, people are dicks. (laughs) 29 years after the original killer in the early 1990s, 23-year-old Eriberto Seda sent letters to New York City police and media organizations claiming he would kill one person for each sign of the Zodiac. With their Zodiac sign tatted on them. (laughs) (laughs) Please. Someone needs that's that's amazing, but also they would need to take out all the people with the Chinese symbol tattoos. Yes. Like this means love and this means peace. <laughs> Fuck you. There's a murderer that's gonna get you. <laughs> oh my or god. Tribal. You have love on your body, you're fucking dead, dude. You have happiness? Oh no, you don't have loyalty. Oh my god. <laughs> that loyalty will get you. <laughs> oh fuck. Definitely tribal tattoos, but yeah, tramp stamps. We can knock out all the people with <laughs> Butterflies, tramp stamps. I'll take some butterflies, actually. Oh, no. Zodiac, anything. <laughs> that's that's about it. <laughs> mm. Sato was a very religious man who attended church regularly. He lived with his mother and half-sister in East New York, where he didn't work and often kept to himself. In his childhood, he was deeply religious and obsessed with weaponry and the teachings of the Bible. Growing up, Seda didn't have many friends, and at the age of 16, he dropped out of high school because he was caught carrying a weapon. He couldn't have any friends because he's too busy fucking practicing his sword moves in his backyard. And talking about the Bible. He's yeah. like, check out my nun- nunchuck skills. <laughs> Let me read you the Bible. <laughs> of course you don't have any fucking friends. Yeah. I also feel like that could have been me with the amount of Bibles that my grandparents sent me. <laughs> For every occasion that's it's possible crazy. to send a gift, I would get another Bible. So I'm just really lucky that I did not give a fuck about the Bible. Otherwise, I could have been that crazy You person. never cracked it open just once? I mean, I looked uh... at it, but I was like, yeah, I know what's in there. Yeah. All that craziness. And yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. I not for the, me. I had the child's picture version. That I had was... that. That was fun and cute pictures. And colorful. And the I, part where they took out all the awful shit and yeah. murder and hate and yeah, hate mongering. Exactly. And yeah. like the prostitutes that were cool. Like, <laughs> I wish there was a pop up child's like Bible book, but with like real <laughs> prostitutes and all the murders and everything that happened bad in it. That would be great. 
the Bible is not for kids, man. No. Mature content as fuck. Yeah, then why the fuck isn't there like a rating like, you know, right NC-17 for, for sure. Cause Seriously. That's pretty fucked up. He should not have been reading that in his youth. So later, as the notorious Zodiac, the ponytailed, Bible-quoting oddball, Heriberto Seda, said he had to kill his victims because they were bad, evil people. Says the guy with a fucking ponytail. <laughs> like, come Talk on. about bad and evil. We know yeah. you're a creep. You have a fucking ponytail. Get out of here. <laughs> it's like it's a rat tail. It's too, the watch. '90s version of the man bun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man. Neighbors said that Seda despised drug dealers and used to tip off neighborhood police officers about who was trafficking drugs. Fucking narc. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably was seeing like just little bullshit street deals mm-hmm. and he's like, they're trafficking. It's yep. like nobody's fucking buying a kilo on your street. You calm down over there. He's got a 10 sack of dope, officer. <laughs> Get him. The neighbors also reported that he had recently stood in the middle of the street and declared... I'm going to start killing. I'm going to start killing because I'm not getting no sex. Fucking go jerk off. Your right or left hand. Pick one. (laughs) You can change it up to make it different sometimes. But you can't because that part of Leviticus in the Bible that says, (laughs) keep your hands off your dick. (laughs) On November 17th, 1989, East New York's 17th Precinct began receiving letters with the headline, This is the Zodiac. The first letter contained a warning of 12 murders, one for each sign of the Zodiac. The letters also claimed that one murder had already taken place. But with only claims and no evidence of actual crimes, the police dismissed the letters as a hoax, which the police were used to receiving. Just file that under Zodiac. Just another one. Yeah. <laughs> On June 6, 1990, identical handwritten letters were mailed to the New York Post and the production office of the CBS news program, 60 Minutes. The contents of these letters gave enough accurate crime details to prove that this was indeed not a hoax. The letters read, This is the Zodiac. The 12th sign will die when the belts in the heaven are seen. The first sign is dead on March 8, 1990, 1.45 a.m. White man with cane shoot on the back in the streets. The second sign is dead on March 29, 1990, 2.57 a.m. White man with black coat shoot in the side in front of house. The third sign is dead on May 31, 1990, 2.04 a.m. White old man with can shoot in front of house. Faust. No more games, pigs. All shoot in Brooklyn with 380 RNL or 9mm, no grooves on bullets. I feel like it was a little rough with the last dude. <laughs> White old man with can. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously there was a lot of uh, spelling and grammar errors, but that's exactly how it was sent. So in addition to the chilling message, each letter was decorated with three pie-shaped wedges each marked with the astrological sign for Gemini, Taurus, and Scorpio. White Gemini, white Taurus, and white Scorpio. I noticed they're all white, too. Yeah. Very yeah. specific yeah, on that it's... one. The other was a cross and circle, like used by the original Zodiac and interpreted as the ancient Celtic cross or the crosshairs of a telescopic gun sight, mm. just like the original Zodiac. Police studied the letters for two weeks before going public with the announcement that the letter's author, Zodiac, or Faust, was wanted in connection with three unsolved shootings for the dates in question. There were certain obvious discrepancies, including the fact that one of the victims had been shot in Queens and all three were still alive, but the description of events was otherwise strikingly accurate. Yeah, so everything that he described in the letter was true. Oh, uh, dokie, I was a little. Oh, I need more coffee. I was just like, wait, okay, is he just guessing it? Like, Those okay. are good guesses, dude. Yeah, I was like, fuck, he was just like, is this white a man carnival cane. game? Are you getting a teddy bear? White man with cane, white man with can, white man something. There's got to be a white man out there that's a, got a can that's dead. Yeah, with a black coat. Like, of course, it's so fucking vague. You're like, if he would have said white man with one blue eye, I would have been like, oh my God. He shot David Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> 
So a similar note, including mention of the Zodiac and Belts of Heaven, had been found beside the third victim with a positive handwriting match, completing the chain of evidence. Target number one was 49-year-old Scorpio Mario Orozco, shot in the back near the intersection of Atlantic and Sheridan Avenue. Orozco told police that his assailant, wearing a brown ski mask and gloves, had crossed the street to intercept him, pressed a gun against his back, and fired one shot, then stood above his body for a moment or two, aimed the pistol at his face without firing, and fled the scene. Just to make him shit his pants. God. That's so awful. It's terrifying. I told you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> The second victim, 33-year-old Gemini Jermaine Montanicedro, was staggering home from a late party in the Bronx when he was gunned down near a subway station six blocks from the scene of the first attack. Shot in the back and seriously wounded, Montanicedro never got a look at his attacker. The third target, 78-year-old Taurus Joseph Prose, was standing on 87th and Woodhaven in Queens when a bearded man approached him and asked for a dollar. Prost refused and was moving away when a gunshot from behind knocked him down. No, I always give him a dollar. I always do. <laughs> I can't resist. I'm just, whatever change I have, I got to give for shit like that. Because <laughs> you never know. No, really. Like, yeah, if anyone's going to have my back, it's going to be the person that, you know, that I just gave a dollar to. Yeah, was, I'm just going to assume that maybe the homeless guy one day that I've been giving dollars to forever will He's have my back. My face, you right? can remember me. That's why you're cool with like the really creepy dude in class. You're just like, hey man, you want a Starburst? Because <laughs> they might be a murderer. They might come to class with, one day with a fucking shark and be like, mm. It's just a precaution. She gave me the pink Starburst. I fucking like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> next. <laughs> you live to see another day, Kel. <laughs> Prost refused and was moving away when a gun shot from behind knocked him down a note found near him had the pie-shaped picture with the symbols for the zodiac signs of the first three victims and a message that read zodiac time to die later prose died of his injuries therefore officially making seda a murderer oh shit I just realized I don't just give dollars to bums or to, I shouldn't say bums, to homeless people just because I think they might save my life in the future. I do it because they might enjoy a tasty beer later <laughs> or I always give a cigarette or something like yeah. that. So it's not just, I'm like, oh, he's going to save me one day. So I just want to throw that in there. I'm, I was like, that sounds really fucking fucked up. Like, I retract my previous statement. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for calling you bums. <laughs> Oh, man. At least and I didn't tell him to get a job. <laughs> oh, man, that would be so much. Then you'd definitely get murdered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, the gunman's pattern seemed to consist of close-range attacks on elderly white males, two walking with canes while Montesinedro's drunken stagger also indicated a physical impairment. Was the can a cane earlier? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Maybe you should um, check that again, spell check. <laughs> White people carry cans, too. I mean, Budweiser, <laughs> Bud Light, <laughs> Coors. All sorts of cans. Yeah. Campbell's soup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the shocker came when a review of background information on the victim showed that each victim did indeed match the astrological sign noted by the attacker. Oh, shit. Mm. None of the wounded men had recognized his assailant, but the gunman obviously knew them well enough to pick his targets by their birth signs. Yeah, how did he know? I know. In short, the attacks were not random, but carefully planned in advance. Task forces were prepared on June 21st, the first day of the astrological month for cancer. But the gunman outsmarted them, shifting his target zone miles away to Central Park. This time, the victim was a homeless man, Cancer Larry Parham, who was shot while sleeping in the park. Aw, dude. I know. He's already sleeping in the park. He's probably on a bench. Yeah. But he's like, nope, he's a Cancer. He's got to die. He would survive his wound, and police were mystified again that his birth sign matched the note that his assailant left behind to mark the crime scene. Afterwards, he told the police that a stranger had asked him about his astrological sign a few days before the shooting. Did he just tape the note to their forehead? Like, <laughs> I don't know where he left him. How do you just... Oh, man. <laughs> Another note with Parham's astrological sign was found near the crime scene. On that note, police discovered a single fingerprint that was later used to identify Heriberto Seda as the killer. 
I'm lying when anyone asks me what my sign is from now. On. I'm fucking <laughs> That's lying. That's what you learned. Yeah. Well, what if I lie and then I pick like the one that he was looking? He's like, oh, I was looking for a Scorpio when I was really a Pisces. <laughs> right. Damn it. On June 22nd, angered by public debate over his link to the original Zodiac killer, Seda sent another letter to the media. Marked with the satanic number 666, it read, This is the Zodiac. I have seen the post, and you say the note sent to the post not similar to any of the San Francisco Zodiac letters. You are wrong. The handwriting looks different. It is one of the same Zodiac, one Zodiac. I wasn't just reading that weird. That was all one (laughs) sentence. (laughs) No commas anywhere. Yeah. I just, him, his spelling, his grammar, his punctuation, it's all, it's all crazy. After a few letters to the media, there was no communication from the Zodiac until August 10th, 1992, when he stabbed Patricia Fonte, a Leo, a hundred times, raising his body count to two dead. A hundred times? <sighs> Overkill. That's insane. It's turning into a pincushion. Like, that Swiss cheese in her. Like, just, oh my god. That's horrific. Fuck this guy. <laughs> I was on the fence before, but fuck this no, guy now. <laughs> fuck this guy. He can't fucking talk right. He, he can't write right. No, and he's a fucking dick. Oh, Ugh. man. Yeah, that's really, really awful. About a year later, on June 4th, 1993, he shot James Weber, a Libra, in the leg while he was walking. Then on July 20th, he crept up on John Diacone, a homeless Virgo, and shot him to death at point blank range. On October 2nd, he shot Diane Ballard, a Taurus, and left her partially paralyzed. Fuck. Yeah. It was not until a letter sent to the New York Post in August of 1994 that these attacks were linked to the Zodiac. Police concluded that it was not a hoax, but were unsure if it was written by the same person or someone who knew the assaults. The saliva used to lick the envelope flap and love postage stamp on the letters to the Post would later be used to identify Seda as the writer. Don't ever lick a stamp. Or Especially a love stamp. <laughs> Just choose that one with the flag on it, damn. <laughs> on June 18th, 1996, the Zodiac Task Force got the break that they were looking for when Seda was brought in for an unrelated crime. Bad Again. grammar. <laughs> <laughs> the grammar Nazis came and ga- got you. You have too many run-on sentences. We gotta figure this out. Go to jail for a week. But that's just how it happens so often. Just like, oh, they caught you by you doing something unrelated that was completely fucking stupid. He didn't have a seatbelt on and then had a thousand tickets or a warrant or something. It's like, fuck. It's that parking ticket. <laughs> Knew I should have fixed my registration. But that was how, um, what was it? Son of Sam was caught with a parking ticket. Oh, Wasn't that the thing? It's just always something like that that's crazy. <sighs> Except where they didn't actually get caught in the act or anything. Yes. It was just a like it a wasn't coincidence. Police work. Or a... It was just a fuck up on the part of mm-hmm. the criminal. After arguing with his sister, Heriberto Seda shot her in the back. Authorities said that Seda was angry with his 17-year-old sister for associating with disreputable types. Apparently, she wouldn't reason, so he shot her in the back. According to Sergeant Joseph Herbert, he was mad at his sister because she was hanging around with the wrong people, drug dealers, and troublemakers, and he didn't like that. Why didn't she just be like, all right, I won't hang out with them, and then just do what most kids do and lie Lie and sneak around and then sneak out of the house and fucking... Yeah, it seems like there was a better way out of this, but, you know, it's her fucking life. She can hang out with who she wants to hang out with. Yeah, I'm just like, like, why didn't you know to... (laughs) Yeah, don't victim blame. (laughs) Yeah, my bad. She's the one that's just like, um, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want because I'm a badass bitch. Exactly. And he was like, (laughs) "Uh, like, no, "No, you're not. (laughs) Yeah. You're grounded. (laughs) Oh, God with a bullet Mm. the girl made it to their neighbor's apartment in time to save her life and call the police during the standoff Seda fired numerous rounds at the police barricades I gotta say I I love my brothers but you're getting fucking cut off you're not invited to Thanksgiving anymore (laughs) right or at least I'm not sitting next to you (laughs) (laughs) you're getting cut off from this side of the table (laughs) yeah you go to the kids table because obviously you can't act like a fucking adult and work it out always pulling guns and reading the bible fuck (laughs) 
After a day-long shootout, Heriberto turned himself in. When he surrendered, he placed 13 homemade zip guns in a bucket and lowered them from the building's roof. <laughs> 13 homemade zip guns. I don't even know what a zip gun is, to I, be honest. He fires zippers at people? <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking terrible. I don't know. But it, he put 13... How big is the bucket? They must be small. Maybe they made like 27 trips for 13 <laughs> guns. <laughs> A collection of weaponry, pipe bombs, devil worship literature, crossbows, knives, and bomb-making manuals were later found at his apartment elsewhere in the city. And he had devil worship literature and the Bible? And the Bible. What a fucking hypocrite dickwad. Yeah. (sighs) Heriberto wore what appeared to be a helmet or saucepan on his head. (laughs) (laughs) he's a complete fucking nutcase maybe he thought aliens were gonna like i mean it's really protection against the aliens and also spf am i right (laughs) (laughs) i don't want to get burned these uva rays i'm you know who the fuck has a crossbow though like I don't know. That's medieval, medieval shit. I mean, he was into that stuff, though, right? Like medieval yeah, the, weaponry. The weaponry and, and, yeah, yeah. Swords. Where the fuck were his parents on this? I know. What? Uh. I know who has crossbows. Ted Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> He's just baby Ted Nugent. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. On his confession to the crime against his sister, Seda drew a cross and three number sevens at the top ends of the paper. Luckily, the detective was familiar with the Zodiac case and recognized the drawing as something the Zodiac killer may have drawn previously. After showing the drawing to other detectives and getting a unanimous suspicion that this was the Zodiac, Sergeant Herbert ran to check fingerprints through the police computer. The prints matched one to the one found at the scene of the 1990s attack in Central Park, and another one to one found at 1994 letter mailed to the New York Post. Sato was questioned about the shootings and eventually confessed. Sato was found guilty on all counts on June 24, 1998. He received a life sentence for murdering three people and wounding one other. I feel like that's inaccurate that there was more wounded. <laughs> But I guess, I don't know. It's always mystifying to me, these court cases where they just don't have enough evidence. Yeah, because you know? clearly it there were other like people. It seems like that was the case in this one, where they just didn't have the specific evidence enough to, to get more counts for him. At least he got that life sentence. So. Yeah, that's the, that's the only good thing, really. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... The next murder, the next copycat killer, uh, used a Wes Craven's classic horror franchise, Scream, as the inspiration for a brutal slaying in a sleepy town of... I'm really not good at pronouncing stuff. I don't know. Jerpinus? Jerpines? Jerpines. 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 It could be one of those. Uh, In Belgium, the crime was committed by 24-year-old truck driver Terry Jardine. Jaredin, it's one of those, but it's definitely his first name is Terry, even though he spells <laughs> it weird. I got that T H I E R R Y. It's mm-hmm. kind of weird, but I got it. In 2001, Jaredin invited his 15 year old neighbor, Allison Cambier, into his home to exchange videotapes, but once she was inside, it was clear that his motive was to make a pass at her. Isn't it always? <laughs> a 15 year old girl, though, that's. I know. Mm hmm. I mean, yeah, he's in his mid twenties. This guy is fucking crazy. I think I was praying for that at fifteen, though. I was like, oh, "Please no. be twenty-one. You can buy me some beer too." <laughs> yes, it's my lucky day. Mm-hmm. You're legal to buy beer. Yes, let's get some forties. When Allison rejected the sexual advances, his retribution was swift and brutal. He excused himself to the next room, and when he returned, Jardine was wearing a replica of the ghost face costume from the 1996 slasher film Scream. Which is fucking terrible. If you just were like, hey, no, I don't really want to fuck you. And he's like, I'll be right back. Yeah, then you would know to just leave. Yeah. Oh, my God. I think we're done here. We've exchanged videotapes or whatever the fuck stupid shit we were doing. Some stupid thing to get me here. And and now that's done, so I'm out. I, here's Scream Back. It was a great movie. Thank you. <laughs> I don't, I'm done with it. Um, he approached Cambier wielding two large kitchen knives. 
Once he reached her, he placed his hand over her mouth to muffle her screams and stabbed her 30 times. He placed her body in his bed and put a rose on in her hand. He then made two phone calls to confess, one to a co-worker and one to his father. When police arrived, he confessed to the crime and said that the murder was premeditated and modeled after Wes Craven's scream film. The crime left neighbors and law enforcement baffled, as he had no history of criminal or violent behavior and no history of psychiatric problems. Which is weird because the people in the beginning, like you were saying, the people who copycat and do stuff like that are you yeah, know, not really one... influenced by that if they don't have psych or mental health problems or he showed no signs of it. It seems very out of the ordinary because everyone had said that he really didn't have any issues. He wasn't kind of that typical person that they were describing as a copycat killer. This guy had what seems to be a normal home, what seems to be a pretty normal mental health or stability mentally. Um, and for some reason he just gravitated to this, this crime and this copycat thing. He just liked that movie so much. He's like, I gotta fucking see what it's like. You know? <laughs> I just I gotta mean, experience it for myself. He thought he was Skeetle Rich. <laughs> oh, damn it. Skeet, Skeet. <laughs> oh my face. I love you, Skeetle Rich. It's kind of like a, like looking into a mirror with this. Cause it's like a copycat of a copycat. Like the movie's about a yeah. copycat of a thing and there's a copycat of a copycat movie. Yeah. It's definitely like a carnival, weird, me- distorted mirror. <laughs> this isn't the first one I've heard too. When I was no, watching there's a bunch of them. after scream, mm-hmm. especially which, cause that mask, I remember when that movie came out, that mask was everybody had everywhere. it. My brothers terrorized me with it. Oh, and, no. Yeah, I mean, it was hilarious, but I really didn't. Yeah, there was a bunch of them. And I don't know. This one was the one that was most famous. But yeah. it seems like there was a lot of people at that time that had seen the movie and were doing some sort of use of the mask incorporated into their crimes. It's fucked up. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean. Are you still afraid of the scream mask? Uh, no. I mean, only because, what was it, like, scary movie that, like, ruined it when yeah. like, uh, That one kind of brought it back. Killing. <laughs> and then he starts, like, rapping and stuff, I think. That totally that really made brought it, okay. it back to the yeah. yeah. I can't, I can't, like, Exorcist, none of that I can't still watch. I just watched Chucky on <laughs> the other day and it was great i'm still not as afraid of that but scream's okay i guess thank god there's like a parody of it (laughs) and thank god for skeeto rich in the in whatever show i was watching uh it was about copycat killers and they were showing the scream they had to fucking open it where it's like this girl's babysitting and she has to be making popcorn in one of those stupid popcorn things that no like and she's got blonde hair. Like, mm-hmm. okay, we know that's not the... Those are not the details that makes this the copycat. Like, no way it's it was... It's all about the mask and everyone fucking knows that. Yeah, it's Nobody like, cares about the babysitting and the hair color and the popcorn. And the phone call. I mean, the phone call is cool. The phone call is part of it. That's a yeah. little bit terrifying. But he didn't do the phone call. Well, the, we couldn't do the best part. At least fuck <laughs> with them a little bit. She runs outside, you know, and you chase her and... Yeah, right. this one was pretty straightforward. He's like, Not I, got very this, imaginative. I got this mask. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. This kid's fucking boring. Yeah. He's really boring. I don't know. It was worth noting just because there were so many copycats of that film. Yeah. But this one was the one that was most famous. But still, it's just there's, the details are not really that intricate or anything. There wasn't a lot of premeditation and planning other than just getting her to the house. Even you know? though he said it was premeditated. Right. I mean, there was premeditation in the sense that he knew when he invited her over he to was exchange the tapes that, yeah. But other than that, a lot of the other copycats, they put a lot of effort and energy yeah. into just really uh, recreating the crimes. And this one. And he was way was off. Not, yeah, put it was her just in the about bed, the mask. Put a rose in her hand. Like, this yeah. in the movie. Yeah. Just get out of here with that. He went way off script. Try harder. Don't fucking <laughs> improvise. Don't, what's it called? A, yeah, improvise. Yeah, uh, exactly. I don't, mm-mm, don't do it. So uh, you're next. <laughs> So the next story is a little bit different in the fact that it did really closely resemble the crime that inspired it. And it was Stephen Doran who imitated Walter White from Breaking Bad. Yeah, this one's a crazy story. And even the crimes itself, um, to me, weren't as... Yes, it's interesting, but it wasn't as engaging as the leading up to it, knowing his history and all Mm -hmm. that. So because one of the things that I found most interesting that his Wikipedia list his occupation as state legislator, parking lot manager, 
bank executive, tutor, drug trafficker. It's a renaissance man. Right? <laughs> so even though like the the part of his life where he was actually basically turning into Walter White was mm-hmm. a little bit short, but all leading up to that, there was just a bunch of shit that this guy was on some... Parking lot manager. Yeah. <laughs> just throw that in there. What? So between 1980 and 1994, Stephen W. Duran, a Democrat, served seven terms as the state representative for the 15th Middlesex House District. His time in the state house included serving as chair of committees on ethics, education, and taxation. During his 14 years in office, Duran focused on budgetary issues, consumer production, drug and alcohol abuse, (laughs) economic development, education, elderly affairs, employment, environmental issues, housing, local aid, social services, and women's issues. All right, I'm voting for this guy. I don't even know. Is he running for an A term? Cause yeah, I mean, great. it just, it all, it sounds good on paper. And that's just one of the reasons why it's not super interesting. But I think that that matters because then it seems like his fall is so much further. Yeah. You know, you came from such a high, respectable place. And yeah. now it's just gonna, you're just, gonna you're falling, crumble. man, tripping. Duran sponsored and co-sponsored a considerable body of legislation during his time in office, including legislation for tax reform, the prevailing wage law, and the Greenhouse Bill. In 1989, Speaker George Kavarian chose Duran to chair their House Ethics Committee. In 1990, the committee chose to take no action against Kavarian after he admitted to hiring subordinates to do remodeling work on his house and accepting free rugs from a legislative vendor. He's creating jobs. Be like, hey, interns, you want to make an extra 50 bucks on this side? But I think it's <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, is that he is that Duran is the head of the ethics committee oh, that's and the person hilarious. that got him oh, into I'm that slow. position <laughs> I'm so slow. <laughs> I'm like what is the fuck violating is the ethics <laughs> which Clearly, never happens in politics. Oh no, ever. never. Yeah, never ever. Unheard of. But I mean, we all know that that's true, but when the person that's kind of in charge of policing that activity and bringing people to justice for violating ethics codes is actually turning a blind eye to that, that's really what was crazy to me. The committee concluded that the conflict of interest law Kavarian admitted to violating does not exist in the House Ethics Code <laughs> and therefore took no disciplinary action against him. Oh, no. She's like, that just seems crazy to me. Like, it just obviously- doesn't exist. Yeah, we don't... In the Ethics House does not have a law on ethics <laughs> and what and any type of conflict of interest and... Yeah, that's just... I don't know. That's just gnarly to me that he got away with that. It's and- a great position to have. And right. he's like, you know what I can't get in trouble for? Doing this because we don't have a law on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Those rugs aren't part of ethics. <laughs> yeah. While serving in the house, Duran had a parking lot, toll booth, or kiosk in Cape Cod and spent most of the summer running it. He had a parking lot, toll booth, and ran it too in the summer, which is like... Yeah, I feel like if you own a parking lot booth, you shouldn't have to work at it. Yeah, like, what is it? Yeah, like, (laughs) Like, why would I do that? You're the boss. Why do you have to sit there and take people's grubby money? Because everyone calls out of work because it's a fucking (laughs) shitty job and it's uh, probably 100 degrees inside that box. (laughs) In 1994, (laughs) after 14 years, Duran chose not to run for re-election and instead entered the banking industry as a vice president at Fleet Mortgage, a subsidiary of Fleet Financial Group. At Fleet, Duran oversaw the company's New England mortgage operations. The district attorney office spokesman said Duran had been arrested twice before. The first was in 1979 for driving while under the influence of alcohol in Framingham, but it was continued without finding, resulting in eventual dismissal. In 2001, Duran was arrested in Haverhill for marijuana possession, and that case was dismissed at Duran's first court appearance. Politics sounds awesome. (laughs) A job in politics sounds great. Gotta get into that. In August 2012, Duran began working as a math tutor at Match Public Charter Middle School in Jamaica Plain. Duran was subject to a criminal offender registry check before he began his service, but Duran passed that check. Because <laughs> he didn't have, he was never convicted of yeah, anything. Yeah, that makes Everything sense. was dismissed. It's not on his record. 
While teaching at the middle school, he was diagnosed with stage 3 melanoma and began chemotherapy. On March 21, 2013, Duran received a package at the school and later departed the school with that package. At about 12.30 p.m., state police pulled over the Jeep Cherokee that Duran was driving just after he left the school. State police had received information that Duran might receive a package with a large amount of methamphetamine and had obtained a warrant to search for that package. So he was dealing dope before this, too, because if someone had to have noticed it and then tipped him right, off... Right, this wasn't the first this time that this happened. That's a weird coincidence that his first package, but yeah, no, he's that been dealing be. dope yep. at the middle school. Yep. Oh, Just put it in my teacher's box. Right. You know? <laughs> State police opened the package, which contained two heat-sealed baggies containing 480 grams of crystal meth. Oof. Authorities then obtained a warrant to search Duran's home. There they found an additional 38 grams of meth, about $10,000 in cash, and a digital scale and other items consistent with drug distribution. He had been inspired by the television show Breaking Bad to take things into his own hands and earn cash so he could receive the surgery and therapy he needed. He was arrested on the charges of trafficking methamphetamine and violating the state's law prohibiting drugs in school zones. The drugs he had had a street value of approximately $50,000. Didn't he see the show? Didn't he? Maybe he didn't finish it, but I mean... (laughs) Maybe he's like, I only got up to like season four, so I don't really know what happened. Where him and his son got like a new car and everything was cool. Everything was great at that point. (laughs) On March 31st, 2014, Duran pled guilty to trafficking methamphetamine and money laundering. He was sentenced to three years in prison, followed by two years of probation. According to one of his defense attorneys, Duran was a terrible addict who had sought treatment and had been substance-free since his arrest. Dude, that is a three years in prison? That's it? For all that, yeah. And two years probation, and he probably paid for his cancer treatment and you know maybe uh the judge and prosecutors were just like you're like walter white and we really like walter white (laughs) (laughs) we're kind of down with you (laughs) yeah i love walter white he's my favorite (laughs) yeah i don't know it does seem a little bit um lenient i don't know it's just not maybe they felt bad he had cancer and they're like we know how this is gonna go yeah, mm. yeah, we don't know. He didn't really kill anyone. He was just trying to get some meth out there. I know. Technically, I don't know. This isn't a copycat, like a murder copycat, but I still thought it was interesting enough yeah. to like, include. It's super interesting, and it's inspired by like one of our favorite shows. Yay. So, yay. <laughs> I mean, you wonder what could happen. I wonder, I mean, he's not a chemistry teacher, but I always wanted to, like, if every chemistry teacher out there was like, I could do that. Right. If I were a teacher at the time that that show came out and I was a chemist or anything, I would just be like, hey, yeah, that's or a really good idea. <laughs> that's a great side hustle. I'm going to get on that and and just sell drugs. I mean, I would have just been slanging drugs to kids at the school. No, if you're going to no. do it, just get some other kids. Be like, look, you guys want to pass chemistry? You all get A's. You no work for tests. me now. Yeah, you work for me now. No, you get A's on your tests. You're gonna you're gonna be a honor student. You'll always have me just slaying these drugs on the side and <laughs> perfect racket. You you passed high school and you made some extra cash and for helping your teachers out. It's teachers helping students, you know. <laughs> you're the TAs. Yeah. But really you're just a drug dealer. <laughs> they might sign you out and let you get out of school and stuff, go on hall like pass. class. Hall pass <laughs> all the time. All right, so thanks so much for checking out this episode on Copycats of Murder Dictionary Podcast. Again, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and don't forget to subscribe and rate and review on iTunes. Thanks again. Bye. Are we are we on back page? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Coming soon. <laughs> Finding the right pros for home projects can be tough and spark a lot of questions like, how do I find a pro who can help? Will they do a good job? Will I get a fair price? That's where HomeAdvisor can help. From leaky faucets to major remodels, HomeAdvisor connects you to the right pro for the job in seconds and even helps you get a fair price. Read reviews, check project cost guides, and book appointments. Go to HomeAdvisor.com or download the free HomeAdvisor app to start your next project.
And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.